Hey y'all, editing Becca here. This is just a reminder that this is a critique of the product and not the person. All of the reviews in my Easily Influenced review series are a critique of the product being sold, not the person representing it or behind the product. Just wanted to get that out there and I hope you guys enjoy the review. Hey there art nerds, so today I am easily influenced and I am easily influenced by Christy Rice. And that means we are taking a look at both her palette and her book today. So unlike with Josie Lewis and Andrea Nelson, Christy Rice has released a full book on how to. So before I started swatching these watercolors, I went ahead and I read the book and I took notes. So this is going to be kind of a two part review where I'm going to talk about the book and keep in mind, it is my first time doing a video style book review. So it's real remedial and that's okay. And then we're going to take a look at her palette, but I want to kind of share my journey of actually buying these watercolors with you. And I have the receipts to prove it. So they'll be running on either this side of the screen or this side of the screen. I'll let editing Becca decide. So these paints were, I purchased these from christyrice.com. They were also available on Amazon, but they've been up and down, up and down, being pulled a lot. And she even addressed that on her own community tab, which I'll show you guys here. So I had a little bit of difficulty getting these, but not too much. And frankly, it's not uncommon for art influencers to sell their watercolors pretty much just through their website. So I didn't really think anything of it, but there's a little bit of a twist. Now I'll share that right here as well. There are some customers who express displeasure at the fact that the pigment info for these watercolors was not made readily available. Now, a lot of professional grade brands have zero problem telling you what pigments are in their paint. They're not going to tell you how much of which pigments. They're not going to tell you how they formulate those pigments, but they don't have a problem telling you what pigments are in the paint. It's pretty common for professional grade watercolors to disclose that partially as a point of pride. Look, we use all these expensive, high quality pigments. Your paintings are going to stand the test of time. They're not going to fade, but also because that's just common practice with watercolors. So there's some backlash that Christy wasn't releasing her pigment information with these watercolors. I happened to catch on her community tab when she actually shared some of the pigment information for these colors. She doesn't say which pigments are for which paints. I feel like she's probably, because a lot of these are pre-mixed convenience colors, I feel like she's probably leaving some out as well as possibly some dyes because she does mention, and I'm going to harp on this because y'all know me, that these are dye boosted pigments. So she didn't really talk about that in that post either, but I wanted to share it with you guys just for full disclosure that these paints have some ups and downs and I feel like the reviews I saw when researching these paints didn't necessarily reflect some of the issues I had or some of the issues that some of the other customers brought up on her community tab. So I'm a little curious about that. I am also curious about why Amazon keeps pulling these paints. This is an area I actually have a little bit of experience with. So you guys know I have four books out. I only happen to have two right here. Uh, the other two are in the studio, but I have four books and all four of them are currently on Amazon. Now, three of them are on Amazon because I went with KDP or create space. So it was just very easy to list them on Amazon. That's a service. That's a reason to possibly work with KDP or old create space is that it would be very easy to get them listed on Amazon. My second book or yeah, it was my second book, Seven Inch Care Volume 2. However, I went with an American based printer and did offset printing and printed a bunch of them. That's what the Kickstarter was for. So um, in order to get those listed on Amazon, we could have shipped them ourselves. They were listed on Amazon as being shipped from us 
for a couple of years, but Amazon would actually hide the listing. Like you could literally look up seven inch Kara and not, it, my stuff would not come up. You could look up Becca Hilburn and my stuff would not come up. Amazon is very sneaky like that. So we decided to try sending some copies of volume two for Amazon to fulfill. And there are some fees involved and you see far less money from the book than if you fulfilled it yourself. And if, if they have to return your books, you have to pay for that as well. So there's, Amazon doesn't make it easy. But even though I have had Amazon hide my books from customers, even customers who are directly looking it up by its given name with the author name and they can't find them, love that for me, links in the description below, I've never had a product actually just be removed from Amazon. I don't, unless you are like grossly misrepresenting what you're selling or Amazon is not understanding what you're selling, I don't really understand how that works. But just because I've never had a problem with it doesn't mean other people don't. So I would really be curious to hear from other small businesses, whether you're making your own watercolors, you're selling jewelry, you're selling clothing, you're selling art prints, you're selling books like I do. I would be interested in hearing about your experiences selling with Amazon down below and whether or not you've ever had a product pulled from Amazon. I'm not saying it points in one direction or another, but it was something that she mentions a lot on her community tab that it can be hard for her to have these up on Amazon. So I'm bringing it up because she brings it up. So it comes up and I wanted to address it. So I actually bought them directly from her site because the way these are listed on Amazon, and I'll talk about that much later on, it looks like it is a knockoff. <laughs> like the way it, the product is described, it looks like it's a knockoff of this palette. And I wanted to make sure I bought the real palette so that I could give it a fair review. So I bought it from the source, even though it cost more from her and I paid shipping. Now she mentions in the receipts that I'm showing you guys that uh, there's gonna be a, th a free uh, additional item since we have to pay for shipping. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later, but I'm wondering if it is the bookmark and envelope that she included. So anyway, I was really excited and very trepidatious about this review because, well, I love reviewing watercolors and I want to help you guys buy the best watercolors for you. And I love cutting through the hype, but I don't want to seem like I am attacking any of these art influencers on a personal level or even on a professional level. I don't know any of these people. I don't have any experience with them. We don't know one another. We have never met. We've never even corresponded. And that is partially because I am very easy to bias, both good and bad. If I like you, I will want to sing your praises. And if I don't like you, I probably won't want to review your product because I know I won't be able to look past my feelings about you. So uh, for the art influencer series, for the most part, it's going to be artists I have. I mean, I can't think of any exceptions. It might come up and that will we'll handle that totally differently. Um, I, I don't know any of these people. I'm going in blind. I like follow their Instagrams. I sometimes watch their YouTube videos or at least I, I'm subscribed so I see the kind of content they're putting out. I have a general idea of who they say they are and who they present themselves to be on their websites, but we don't know each other. We don't have any anything personal. And I will reiterate that I am all about artists making money and I'm all about artists making money. Honestly, I am not here to criticize anybody's prices. I am not here to knock down anybody for selling their art at whatever price point they want to sell their art at. And I do know that working with manufacturers is quite expensive, especially if you can't work in the bulk scale that some creators do have access to. So I am not here to criticize or talk badly about that. These are all artists who I like their work. I like how their work looks. So I will always encourage you guys, regardless of what I say about their art supplies, and the intention is just to help you guys Spend your money on art supplies you like. That's been the theme of this channel for the duration of this channel. Reviews, comics, and art supplies. I just want you to help you spend your money on things you'll like. 
My advice is always going to be, if I don't like their art supplies, that you support them in other ways, whether you're buying prints or you're buying their books or you're buying original art or you're buying one of their classes, I am in no way advocating that you not support this artist. Whether it is Christy or anyone else I choose to review in this series, that's not my game. As a fellow artist and fellow small business who makes money selling art and art prints and books, my goal is not to take money out of their mouths. My goal is not to smear them. My goal is not to ruin their lives. My goal is just to review the art supplies and help you figure out if the art supplies are a good fit for you. So this is a long one. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I just finished reading How to Make Art for Joy's Sake Free Spirited Watercolor. This is one of Christy Rice's books. She has many such books. Now, those of you who know me, I make very anxious watercolor and very anxious content. So the idea of doing something in such a free spirited manner is ooh, a little anxiety inducing for me. So since I wanted to actually talk about the book in depth and I didn't want to just go with vague impressions, I took notes, but I opted for Art for Joy's sake because this seems like the real tutorial book. And since we're talking about her palette, I also wanted to talk about at least one of her books. I like how a lot of these art books are going for the spiral binding and the flat lay. That is just super helpful. I'm not even, I'm being serious. Like it is super helpful. It makes it easy to keep the book open. It makes it easy to follow along. I wish more professionally published art books went this route. She has a really nice table of contents. I'm gonna point out some weird things here because like as a watercolor artist and illustrator with several books of my own out, I just, you know, something you might notice and wanna pay attention to for your own books. So she has um, examples of what you're going to be doing and breakdowns is presented in a really appealing and very pretty way. In general, the book is very bright, colorful, and appealing. You would want, if this was at somebody's house, you'd want to pick this up and flip through it, even if you're not interested in watercolor. It's just laid out in a very inviting way, and I really like that as well. It's just a pretty book. I appreciate that she explains and demonstrates her favorite materials and methods for making palettes. That's kind of early in the book. Um, some of these watercolor how-to books do this, some don't, some assume you already know how to paint, some don't. Um, I would venture that she is assuming you are an intermediate painter for the most part, just based on like her talking about like, uh, just grab your favorite green. It could be any green, but your favorite, you'll know it's your favorite because it's the pan that's used the most. I kind of assume somebody's painting a lot. There isn't anything wrong with that. I'm just pointing out if you are an absolute beginner, I don't think this book is meant for you and there's nothing wrong with that. So I appreciate that, um, sorry, the technique section could use more photos. So I got spoiled by some of the Japanese and Chinese watercolor books. That's like my goals. Let me see if I can find that for you guys. Um, I just I just find that like not enough photos skips around a little much. Again though, um, this might be aimed at an intermediate artist who's already familiar with some of these things and might just be looking for some new techniques. And she also has a YouTube channel, so you could look some of these things up as well. I'll give her a pass for that since she does share a lot of informative how-to web content. The book is set up to introduce common watercolor. Okay, so it's set up, there's three main sections. You have your materials and techniques, you have your rules and then her suggesting how to break them, and then you have some watercolor projects. And I really like the conceit of setting up the rules and then how to break them, especially for a watercolor intermediate like myself, but that would be confusing for a beginner. Again though, I don't necessarily think this book is meant for a beginner. She shows how to follow the rules and then how to break them with the same project. So I really like that duality of like, this is what they tell you to do versus this is another way that you could do it that might yield a better result. Uh, if you go to art school or take art classes, they often teach the, you have to know the rules to break them. This kind of follows in that mentality. Now I do disagree with her wholeheartedly about Crayola because 
I teach teenagers who often can only access or afford Crayola products and um, they've never gotten to try anything else, whether it's lack of access or lack of resources. And they end up hating watercolor and the watercolor process because Crayola has, it's just really kind of difficult to deal with if you want to paint people or if you want to paint animals or you want to do layers or you want to do more detailed work. So while she's a big proponent of like, use what you can afford, have some Crayola laying around, I don't agree with that, but we also have very different use cases. We teach very different demographics. We make very different kind of art. So that's just my little two cents there. What works for her often won't work for me, and that's totally okay. I really like that she has a section on brush exercises because for the kind of florals that she's known for, these kind of exercises are a really big part of how to paint those florals successfully. And building up that skill set, building up that flexibility, having that muscle memory is just really huge. So I really appreciate her sharing it. I'm trying to find it. I mean, she's got like some example ones, but she also has some like exercise exercises that you can copy. Now she is not big on do as I say, do as I do. I am also not big on do as I say, do as I do, but for some of these warm up and preparatory exercises, I wish she would give more explanation, more details, show a little better. She is also a one brush kind of gal, it's the dagger, and um, nothing wrong with that. We just very different worlds, because I, if I had to pick one brush, it'd probably be like a good quill. So if I were to do her exercises, I think I would definitely want to try them out with the dagger, but also want to try them out with my own preferred brush. And that's not anything against her. It's just a, a note on my point. And I was kind of thinking I might try doing some of her exercises when we review the paints. The exercises section has a lot of interesting ideas, but not necessarily as much instruction or as many examples, like step-by-step -step examples as I'd like. I realize she wants us to just dive in and be fearless, but some ideas are not clear enough to get the gist. Um, and then I, I've done some little stars as well, just kind of for myself. So one of the themes in this book too, is she expresses that the paper is more important than the paint. So uh, I, in my notes I wrote, so is this a free pass if her paints suck? <laughs> because uh, she's, she's a big paper evangelist and I'm kind of the opposite in a way like you guys see me paint on cellulose you guys see me paint on cotton rag I think both have their place and I do have my preferences I think both though can be useful and uh, she is very like these are the papers I like these are the papers I recommend whereas when it comes to paints I'm the one who's like let's go with professional grade because professional grade will paint well even on terrible papers so I just thought that was kind of interesting it's really neat to see different artists approaches to the materials i'm not saying she's wrong i'm not saying she's right it's just neat to see other people's viewpoints i also was curious because she talks a lot about paints in this book like her paints that she likes and so it did make me curious how her recommendations compared to the paints that have her name on it um she isn't brand loyal she uses a bunch of different brands and that that's great i'm not brand loyal either um but i want to know what brand her paints with her name on it are or what are what brand are they the closest to i have not read any reviews i've not watched any reviews i have not opened mine yet i've been too busy i like it to be fresh i want to come to it completely unbiased i am betting mungyo because mungyo is a very popular choice for that i also challenge myself to put together a dot palette of her preferences for me to compare it against her paint so time permitting i would love to do that uh, hopefully this video won't be two hours long because i can't render a video that's that long she also has a texture development section which i thought was a really nice inclusion that is an area i think of weakness in my work so i liked that she included it little doodles showing how the brush is actually held to achieve those textures would be really helpful a dagger brush is a very flexible brush you can do a lot with it 
um, but it all kind of boils down to how you hold the brush. And I feel like a lot of her techniques are, um, are inspired by Chinese watercolor or have a lot in common with Chinese watercolor. And I know that with Chinese watercolor, a lot of the marks you make are inspired by how you're holding the brush. So I think that would be important. It's all dagger brush and the dagger brush is synthetic. It's very affordable. If it were me, I would say quill, but you guys know that. We do have very different styles and approaches and I am really glad that we are so different and she handles things very differently from how I do because I want to be challenged and I want to leave my comfort zone. That's where the growth is. She does a lot of textures through various layers and colors and I like that. It's very visually interesting, but it also requires good concentration and being in a flow state, which I think for a lot of us who have I'm not saying Christy doesn't have other responsibilities. Like, I, I don't know her. I'm not making these kind of comments. Um, but, like, for example, for the past, since May, there have been many of my days I get home very late and I have barely any time to make any art, let alone do any housework because I'm taking care of family. So this isn't like a critique on her. It's more like I love the idea, but I acknowledge that as an ADHD person, I would have to have a like quiet Saturday. Well, I don't get those anymore. I'd have to have a quiet Sunday to be able to actually sit and do that. But it's a technique that I would like to bring into my work. I think it's very playful. I think it's very fun. And it adds a lot of visual interest where Sometimes I feel like my work starts feeling very static and I think that would be a fun element to bring in to kind of liven things up even though I do a lot of portraiture and animal and representative painting and less abstracted sort of painting. I really like the textures in play in the veggie exercise and I think that'd be fun with a really open line work like kind of like an 80s vibe with my art style. I think that would be really cute. The cicadas apparently agree with me. Also, maybe for the review, like to pick an exercise from the book and do it as a bookmark. I think that might be a good way to challenge her watercolors to live up to the exercises presented in the book. And I really get the impression that they are meant to complement each other, the book and her palette and the book and her brushes. I did not order the brushes. I got to draw the line somewhere. I'm pretty picky too. I prefer natural fibers. So, you know, I didn't want to review them just to dunk on them knowing that I don't prefer those fibers. So um, I think that's like a fair challenge. And I think it'll give us a good idea of how well her paints perform in their intended use case. This is like working through a how-to book, working through an instruction book. I feel like I haven't had that kind of discipline. Really, I haven't had that kind of free time since I was 26. But I do think faithfully following along and just trying things out and taking risks is how I grew the most. So I definitely do think these kind of books can be hugely helpful, especially if you already have some skills and you're looking to expand your comfort zone. Some of the projects like the patterns are super simple but satisfying and a good way to get to know your brush. There's also a textile pattern section with how to draw steps, like how to do different parts from that textile. It's a nice inclusion that many watercolor books neglect. They often assume you can already draw. I appreciate that she wants to make this approachable. In fact, if that was something, if I were going to do a watercolor book like this, the, the back of volume two does have a how-to section, but if I did like a full watercolor book, there would be a lot of how to draw in it because a lot of what I do is very re re relevant to the line art that we're working with. Let me show you guys what I'm talking about. Oh, this is what I mean. Some of her projects have way more photos and I like that. I wish everything had way more photos. And I, I realize as someone who used to do an art blog and still does YouTube, it is actually really hard to get all those step-by-step -step photos so, you know, mad respect for the amount that she has. I would love to see more. But we actually kind of talk about that in the AliExpress art book video. So if you're curious about what I think is like a good amount to have, you should check that video out. I like the variety of projects in the book that utilize different techniques and skills. So basically every project is a little bit different. Every project utilizes different techniques and different skills and sometimes different materials, whether it's a line and wash, or you are utilizing watercolor pencils for the effects that they have, or you are painting loose florals, or you're doing pen and ink with fruit. Like there is a wide variety of 
different subject matter that she covers. She doesn't go in depth in anything. And I was kind of hoping and expecting that she would, especially just kind of what I've seen of her online presence. But um, I did kind of like the variety. It was good to see that she had a lot of depth. I, I, this is a bad admission on my part. I kind of assume based on what I've seen from her online that it was a lot of loose watercolor florals and like that was her skill set. But she's actually a very talented painter and has a lot of pizzazz and joy de vivre for her art. So this book was really nice because it really introduced me to like the wide array of projects and ideas and things that she likes to dabble with that you might not, that might not always make it onto YouTube. She does a lot of line work and line drawing. Like, let me show you guys, because we refer, she and I refer to line work very differently. I'm usually referring to an inked line work that is in the illustration before we started painting it, or we add it to the illustration afterwards. And she is using her dagger brush. She uses her dagger brush to add in like these really delicate fine lines that really tie here, this is a better example, that really tie what she's doing together. And they also add a lot of movement and visual interest. And that is another element that I really like. And I think that could add a lot of visual interest to my standalone illustrations. Maybe even to some of my comic pages. But again, this takes focus and flow state that has gotten very challenging for me to harness in my life right now. So while I love the idea and would really like to incorporate it, I don't know when that's gonna be possible. So something I don't like about this book is I felt like the book just sort of ends on the last project. I mean, there's an about the author, but there isn't, let me show you the last project. I'll also just be biased. I, I'm not a fan of the last project. It's a mixed media, uh, real world elements collage style thing. And while I think that has validity and I think some artists would enjoy doing it, and I think it's probably an excellent exercise to me, Personally, it feels like a waste, but that is my personal opinion based on my own art and my own anxiety problems and how the kind of art I make and how I sell it and what my goals are. Okay, like I'm not dissing this project. Of the, all the projects in this book, this is the one I am the least interested in, but that is good because she has a lot of different projects they cover a lot of different techniques. It's a pretty a pretty wide gamut. So it makes sense that there would be one or two projects that I would just be like, yeah, nah, that's that's absolutely not for me. Just, I felt like it just kind of ended. <laughs> you know, like we fall off a cliff and we ended. There wasn't a page with her other books. There wasn't a page really with her social media. The about the author was very standard. Like I've been in this store and this store and this store and I work for this, these people. Um, and I guess I was just looking for an index or I was looking for an FAQ or tips and tricks or brush maintenance or any anything like that. Maybe when I do my watercolor book, I'll include a whole section about having rheumatoid arthritis and how to make art when you have no time and how to make art while dealing with a degenerative hand problem. Because at least that's something different and that's something that people aren't bringing to the table and that's something relevant to my life. And I would have liked to have seen a little bit of that from her book. So I just finished it um, and I wanted to share my thoughts and get kind of gussied up for the occasion, dress like uh, I got dressed for joy's sake. I wanted to kind of share my thoughts with you guys before we do the review, because to be honest, I have no idea when I'm going to get to do the watercolor review, it's going to take a couple days, I think. And I wanted to make sure I talked about the book while all the ideas were fresh and while I still knew where to find everything rather than trying to get back into the into things. So I will now hand it off to future Becca. All right. So as part of our Easily Influenced series, you know, we got to talk about the things that they do. And that includes their online presence because for a lot of these people they would not be art influencers if they didn't have an online presence. So since we're doing Christy Rice, went ahead and googled her. We're going to start with her website, Paint Crush, Artful Living with, ah, a pop-up, I could get art in my inbox. Artful Living with Christy Rice. Apparently she has recently joined TikTok. 
and she has her online shop. I know she also offers ceramics, which I think are pretty cool, and she also sells originals. So if you want a little bit of her art, you can have it. She also has these coloring page bundles that do come with dot cards. Man, I feel like I am just like selling it. This is where I ordered, either ordered it through her website or one of the times she posted on YouTube about the palette being available again. I know she has, I will give her this, her art supplies are beautiful. They are very aesthetic. I don't know if they are particularly better than other art supplies, but I do appreciate an attractive art supply bundle or these coloring pages as well. And they come with dot cards, which is pretty handy. This was the copy pencil that she was talking about in her book. Of course it's of course it's sold out. She bought like vintage stock. Of course, of course it's sold out. Now as for like the watercolor notebook, I guess that just means the cover is watercolor and the interior is not. So she's got like a lot going on and I don't want this video to take two billion years. So I'm gonna try to swifty it up a little bit and probably have to edit the heck out of this. I am over here so envious because I remember when I used to be this productive and that I, I just can't any I just can't anymore. The desire is there, the time is not. Actually her art prints are really quite affordable. Though I have a feeling she's doing the smart thing where you go onto Canva or one of those other services and you upload your art and it like places it in a frame so you have like the artful frame thing going on. Nothing wrong with that. I should be smart like that. I think I have to take real world photos of everything with real lighting in my real house. And then we have the books, which this is the one that we just talked about. She also has a bunch Buku coloring books, as well as note card bundles and her Painterly Days series. Other than maybe the painter's wedding, I don't really see a whole lot of instruction books. Like she Downloads and experiences. Let's see if Christy's another one of those who's doing classes, because they all do. Okay, yes, Zoom, what? Wow. Wow. That's expensive. <laughs> so if you would like to take a one-on-one -on -one watercolor experience class with Christy, that is $350 via Zoom. Or you can do the Zoom gathering, paint a joyful peony succulent or landscape. Let's see if this is meant for groups, like meant for like a group on, like you bring your friends. 90 minutes for up to 10 participants. Okay, so you could group, you could book this for like your family or you and your friends. Um, it's not, it's not just like some randos that you don't know. And then that is just accessories. So it seems like she is very busy. But you guys can probably see why from the book review, I thought it was going to be mostly loose watercolor florals, right? Because this is a lot of what she does. And um, while I really like that she covered other topics, like just as a, a book lover, I like that she covered other topics. And as an art nerd who's always curious how other people work, I like that she covered other topics. I was hoping she would share, share more of the secret sauce uh, because I am terrible at loose watercolor florals and I was hoping to learn more about that. I know she paints like all the time. She has stuff coming, okay, there we go. I don't, those were just her recommended videos. Something, and this is a personal something, something I'm not a big fan of is she does these massive haul reviews. Um, and she started doing these when I was in the middle of one of my massive haul reviews, but the, we do it very differently. Hers, it's all in one video and 34 minutes and 11 seconds to talk about all these palettes, right? And I can't manage to compare two palettes in under an hour. So we have like super different approaches, but just like the logistics side of things for me, like I spend a lot of money buying those palettes. 
and it takes a long time for me to accrue all of those because I'm using the funds from Patreon, so it's basically as I can afford to do it. So you all better believe I am going to do the individual reviews for every palette. I am going to do a big recap as well, but like I, I got to make that money work for me. And then I do see some like beginner watercolor tutorials here. She really loves her Crayolas. I guess there's nothing wrong with that. I will also point out, I know her intention isn't to teach you how to be a professional artist selling your art, but uh, Crayolas, y'all, are not going to hold up. So just, just keep that in mind. Anyway, her watercolor channel is as joyful and inviting as her books. She's also one of the ones who, like, almost always has her face in the thumbnail. I think I... I need to be better about doing that. I'd have to like my face a little bit better to want to always be in the thumbnails, though. And when I go off screen, I am so sorry. I have to constantly adjust it. And then here is her Instagram. Oh, I feel like it's pretty easy to see the appeal in her work. Her work is very bright, very colorful. It's very invitingly presented she's got the whole like look at the brush stroke what I'm like to make it look like she's actively painting it even if she's not which is nothing wrong with that that's a very clever thing to do and I'm too stupid to do that actually I cannot take a photo and hold a brush at the same time I'm just not not good at that but like she's using the very clever inviting tricks to like encourage you to paint along with her and many of these are also reels so maybe they are live action and she was just smart and selected exactly the right thumbnail. I can see it. I can see the appeal. I, I probably am about to get real influenced because I'm, I'm buying in. I'm like buying into the hype. I'm here for it. Um, I thought I was following her. I guess Instagram just recommends her work to me all the time because I see a lot of her stuff. Like I saw the Barbie one recently, but uh, I guess... You know, Instagram is doing what Instagram is doing. But she has been hyping up her Patreon over on her community tab for, like, forever. So let us... Here is her Patreon. So if you are curious about her tiers and what she has to offer you guys... So anyway, that should give you guys a pretty good idea of like what her social media presence looks like, what her art looks like, what she has to offer, what she's selling, why people might be easily influenced by Christy Rice, and whether or not her art style vibes with your personal aesthetic and you might want to own some of her art or color some of her books or maybe even purchase an art class with her. So we've taken a look at the book. Now it's time to take a look at the watercolor. It came wrapped, as you guys can see, in this box. Some high expectations for this palette after reading that book. So let's pry it open. Ah, it's a lot of box for not a lot of paint. So the Art for Joy Sake palette is packed in here. We'll take a look at that in a moment. We have some cornstarch packing peanuts. I am a fan of that. We have a little thank you card from Christy Rice. It says, thank you so much for ordering from ChristyRice.com. Thank you for taking this step towards finding your moments of escape. My joy-focused approach to watercolor art offers simple ways to simple to adopt ways for all levels of painters to make art for joy's sake. And then she's got her socials down there. That's rather clever. There was also a, and I'm not going to show it because it has my address. Well, I can fold it in such a way. A little invoice here. I appreciate that. Unfortunately, the invoice does not say how much I paid for the palette. I, there is also a watercolor postcard in here. Very cute. Maybe we will. It feels like this is probably on a cellulose. Maybe we can try painting on this. And then there is an envelope. So that is actually very thoughtfully packed. You have the paints, and then you have something you can actually try the paints out on. Not only do we have bubble wrap, but we also have it individually plastic wrap. That feels a little bit excessive. One or the other would have been fine, not both. Tissue paper or glassine would have been a more eco-friendly way as well. 
So, let's take a closer look. The exterior says Art for Joy's Sake Palette Paint Crush by Christy Rice. Set of 12 solid pigments and a limited edition tin. Dye, bo Dye boosted pigments with light fast rating 7, excluding fluorescence. Made with gum arabic and vegetable glycerin binders. Y'all, if this is Mongyo watercolors, I am going, I may have to yeet this into the ditch. No, I'm not going to throw this into the ditch, but I might want to throw it into the ditch if it is yet again Mongyo watercolors at this price point. My name is Christy Rice, and I believe in the power that making art holds to bring joy to our lives quickly. My approach to painting is one that ensures that stress is not part of the experience. I guess she's not sharing her art online then. I just want you to have an amazing time splashing some color around. The Art for Joystick palette features 12 uncommon pigments that are dye boosted, perfect to kickstart your colorful creative journey. These are the new classics meant to add a little zing to your watercolor collection. 12 vibrant, never chalky, highly pigmented, non-toxic pigments developed with, by a joy-driven, watercolor-obsessed painter. Important! Scan this QR code to access my one hour. Let me show you how these pigments will rock your world lesson. Un not going to share that with y'all. I may check it out. I also literally just finished reading her book. And then she's got all of her socials right here. Her Instagrams, her YouTube, her Facebook, her Tickety Talk, and her Pinterest. So one other comment, um, since a lot of users are on mobile, I'm actually on desktop, but a lot of users would be viewing this on mobile, is to have multiple QR codes on that included thank you card to drive people to here to these sites so that you're not typing everything in and to make sure you end up with the correct Christy Rice because some of these are not like I looked up paint crush and it didn't bring her in fact it was like we don't know who you're talking about so that's a little a little tip now I'm going to show you the thing that is currently concerning me the absolute most dye boosted pigments with a light fast rating of seven excluding fluorescence dye boosted pigments now y'all don't know who I am, I really sincerely hope you will check me out on these social media sites to kind of get a feel for the kind of work I do and where I'm coming from. I am a watercolor comic artist, educator, and illustrator. I make the watercolor 7-inch Kara, which you guys, I hope you guys will read it. It is all watercolor. It is beautiful. We have a very, Christy and I have very different art styles, very different art needs. And I am going to be looking at this palette and talking about it if it is useful to me. I may do a mini field test where I replicate some of the techniques she talks about in her book uh, to see if it works for her or works based on what she is teaching in her book. And that might be a more general way of seeing if this review in this palette will be helpful to you but keep in mind i paint people animals plants and environments i am a sequential artist i paint comics our needs are very different i may not like this palette and you might love this palette and that is not anything about you every watercolor artist is different and has different preferences i am going to hold this palette to the standard that they promise on the website. They all promise professional grade pigments and often <laughs> they deliver a little lower than that. I'm also going to hold it against the standard she describes in her own book. And I will remind you guys, she does say you can use Crayola to watercolor and she and I do not agree on that one. So we do have different standards and different expectations. And I will try to keep that in mind. But she also talks about several professional grade paints and specific paints from different brands that she particularly likes. So I am going to try to compare the palette that she has put together here, put her name on, put her branding on, against the paints that she says that she likes and recommends in her own book. <laughs> it feels a little cruel. Lord help me if I ever have a watercolor palette come out, right? It better be like the best palette. Hey, Da Vinci, call me. So, um... Let us go ahead and unwrap this, this video. And, oh, it is in there. There's a lot of packaging with this, and I don't like, I, I don't mind the cardboard. I mind all the, like, extra, like, paper would have sufficed quite well. All right. It is, I will give her this. It is a very, very pretty mini palette. It is very cute.
these smell funny and I am getting steamy art vibes. I'm getting cheap watercolor vibes. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm getting I'm getting some not great vibes here. See, this is the dangerous part of me having done the student grade showdown and reviewed a bunch of garbage palettes from AliExpresses. I can figure out who's white labeling from who. So inside, let me pull back out so you guys can see. Okay, this is her swatch sheet. You do, you here, create your own unique swatches. This paper is uh, just cardstock, not watercolor paper, not hot, hot press, not even a textured cellulose. And then she has the littlest amount of space for some swatching ideas. Then you have her swatches here. Do we have real paint names? No, we have Jane Davenport style paint names. Do we have pigment information, y'all? Mmm, I'm not seeing it. And then here's where you can test your colors here. Uh, and then we have our, let me show you how these pigments will rock your world. I, I may watch that on my own time after swatching these. Um, and then we can share our discoveries at how do you swatch an art for joy's sake. I don't think she wants me to share my discoveries in her hashtag. Swatching your new pigments is an exploration. So paint outside the lines, abandon those tiny squares of color, and really experience the beginning of your new watercolor adventure. So in her book, she says you can skimp on paint, but you can't skimp on paper. So, so Christy, 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 why is this on cardstock? We both know why. It's because this is what you could get the printer to do, and it's affordable, but like, this is, we both know, this is not the best paper to swatch watercolors. This is terrible paper to swatch watercolors. I'm going to swatch these watercolors on this paper. Colors lightening up when you spritz them with water is not 100% a sign that these are full of extenders and optical brighteners, but it is often a sign and it is a red flag of optical brighteners and extenders. But our first red flag already appeared and we're still skiing down this slope. We're on, I think, the third flag because these also kind of smell bad. And uh, they are also extruded paints, which I know some of you guys like. I have kind of mixed feelings about extruded paint. So uh, we, are, we are not, look, I'm just going to caveat right here, okay? I didn't start the Art Influencer series to expecting to get a bunch of student grade watercolors that I overpaid for. And I do actually have some Da Vinci collaborations that I'm going to talk about in another video with Denise Soden and with Charlie O. So I promise this isn't Becca rags on art influencers. It's Becca reviews art supplies honestly. So we do have some that I know will be good coming down the pipeline. Another comment, okay? So we don't have a one-to-one -one swatch here, okay? It's not actually in order. So I'm going to have to spend time figuring out which of these colors is which of these colors and then locating it on here. What were you thinking, Christy? What is this about? Why did you do that? Look, in my opinion, I like a swatch card that fits in the lid and is one-to-one -one for quick and easy reference. That is the most useful swatch map. What is this? What is, what is this even? It's not even on good paper. Her swatch card is a joke. It's like on cardstock, which is great for printing and folding, awful for watercolor or judging watercolor. It's double-sided and invites double-sided swatches and play. Again, why on this paper? And it is huge for a palette this size. The swatches are in reverse row order, by the way, so you have to kind of seek and find to figure out where the colors go. The colors use non-standard paint names, partially to be cute, like Jane Davenport, but I feel like also to hide what colors these colors are trying to be. There is no real pigment information available, just kind of hints. The, the bad vibes for these are strong, but this paper is so awful for watercolor, like look at these splotches, that I can't quite tell how bad they are yet. Good thing we're swatching it on Cotton Rag next, eh? I'm getting semi art vibes. So my best guesses for what these colors are supposed to be. Phthalo blue, diox purple, magenta, maybe red violet, jean brilliant, sap green, green gold, or maybe yellow ochre, viridian or phthalo green, maybe van dyke brown or sepia, cadmium red, 
uh, maybe brilliant pink, um, like a Holbein or a Kusakabe brilliant pink, titanium buff, and a fluoro yellow. I have to admit, this is really not promising. I am really getting semi art slash dye based cheap watercolor vibes off this palette. And for 44 bucks, I really cannot fathom why. But, you know, this paper, not a great choice to swatch these paints on. Let's go get the Blick and see if they swatch any better on that. These paints swatch a bit better on the Blick cotton rag paper. This is a better representation of what the colors actually are, but I still feel like they are very underwhelming considering how big her promises were. These do swatch a little bit better on a cotton rag paper than they did on this awful, awful cardstock. This would have been a better choice for a swatch sheet, especially because she talks about using a quality paper so much in her book. So I went and looked up what she actually recommends, and it actually makes a lot of sense as to the color choices specifically on this palette. I'm going to go dig through my stash. I, I have all of these colors, but not necessarily from these specific brands, so I'll do my best. So from Windsor Newton, she recommends Opera Rose, Cobalt Turquoise, and Cadmium Red. From Daniel Smith, she recommends Mood Glow, Moon Glow, Cascade Green, and Buff Titanium, as well as Payne's Blue Gray. From Mission Gold, she recommends Shell Pink and Horizon Blue. From Holbein, she recommends Jean Brilliant. From Core, she recommends Cadmium Yellow Medium. And... As I look at these colors, I'm like, yeah, that actually makes sense. Yeah, I thought this was a green gold. I have a feeling it's supposed to be a warmer, <laughs> a warmer yellow than we're actually getting. It's kind of a muddy color. But look, there's our buff titanium dupe. There's our shell pink dupe. There's our, what is it, cadmium red? Yeah, our cadmium red dupe. She doesn't list any recommended browns. And uh, she did not recommend any fluorescent yellows. So that feels like if she herself put together this palette, it does feel like kind of a weird choice compared to what she recommends in her own book. But some of these colors, like this is almost like, a, well, these between these two, almost like a cobalt turquoise. Almost, not really, like a horizon blue, but I can, it, I have a feeling it's like the closest color matches from the manufacturer that she was working with. These also muddy the water pretty, pretty significantly. There are a lot of opaque and semi-opaque, well, okay, I say that, but then we look at the swatches and it doesn't really reflect that, but there are several colors that should be opaque or semi-opaque like this one here or this and that, uh, maybe even this brown. Um, but because they are, and I got some blue on me, dye enhanced watercolors, we're not going to see any granulation. We are not really going to see, I have a feeling we're not going to see a whole lot of liftability across the board, which is disappointing because for really loose, expressive, and joyful watercolors, I generally think of those striking granulators that just make you take or like <gasps> and uh, really remind you that you're working with watercolor specifically and that's something that dye based watercolors where whether we're talking about radiant watercolors the liquid ones or uh, echo line watercolors that's something that they can't really bring to the table that is unique to working with pigments made of earth and minerals so um Let's do some color mixing, shall we? I want to save room on this block to do a comparative swatch against the watercolors that she recommends in her book. So I'm going to do a little switcheroony here. And we have a pre-cut sheet of Blick watercolor paper left over from one of my classes. And I'm just going to tape this down. And we'll do our color mixing and our wet-into-wet -wet test on here. 
since there aren't a lot of traditional primaries or mixing colors, I just kind of wung it and mixed colors I thought would make for interesting mixes. Because the color choices are interesting, you can theoretically mix some really interesting and refreshing colors. But most draw way less saturated than the parent colors, even with the really intense colors like Flow and Passion or Flow and Fearless. These seem to fall apart and quickly use their impact with the addition of water. And yes, I realize that's how you dilute watercolors, but like more than you would expect or want to see. The opaque colors really fall apart past, fall apart fast, as does the fluoro. This would not be the palette I would pick for painting people, that's for sure. Although we have the potential for some really interesting color mixes, you guys can see that the resulting colors are often far less saturated than the colors that went into it. Even with really high chroma colors, they just start to kind of fall apart. I did start to get a little bit of granulation with this, I wouldn't call it a dioxine purple. It's mm, almost like a, it's hard to put my finger on it. A red violet or a mauve or um, a rose of ultramarine or ultramarine violet like in that category but there's still really not a lot of granulation and then some of these lighter colors like this one here they just fall apart basically entirely as soon as you add water which for an artist who does a lot of techniques that have a lot of wet into wet and intercolor blending and a lot of adding your watercolor into your water, it's strange that these would fall apart so much. They're high chroma like straight out of the pan, but as soon as you start adding water, they really start to fall apart very quickly, which I would not call highly pigmented, nor would I say that they're ideal for professional watercolor artists. I also have some doubts about how light fast these are. This is the only color that screams that it's a fluorescent to me, but that blue kind of teeters on it, as does this hot pink here. She doesn't actually designate which of these would be fluorescents. She just says that these all have a light fast rating of seven, except for the fluorescents, without designating the fluorescents, which is, honestly, it feels kind of hinky to, to me. Uh, that was That is something that could easily have been designated. But then again, the pigment information could have easily been given as well. So the wet and wet test is something that I use in, it came about during the student grade showdown. It reveals many sins. And um, it really kind of shows the true nature of watercolors. And also gives me a good idea of how useful those watercolors might be to me. And I am trying not to penalize uh, Christy Rice based on the color selection of the paints. Uh, different artists have different favorite colors. Different artists have different use cases. I'm trying not to uh, critique the palette itself, although I just pulled as many. We're going to talk about this more, but I pulled some of her recommended colors. I, so it'll be interesting to compare this palette here against her recommended palette. But just going on the colors I read to you guys, there are some of these colors in that palette, kind of, sort of, but a lot of these are not really in that palette. So... It, I mean, even just judging her based on her own recommended palette, it's kind of like, Argh. These also muddy the cup so badly. I went and dumped it out and refilled it with fresh filtered water, and it's still kind of cloudy. That is, that's not a good sign. These are definitely dye-based. They really start to fall apart in water. It takes a lot more paint to get any kind of color. These are also getting used up pretty fast. I definitely feel these are more student grade than professional grade, which is funny because, again, Christy did that big student grade comparison video, so she knows what bad watercolors are and what mediocre watercolors are, how they handle, and what they look like.
I feel like the wet and to wet test really shows that these are very dye based. And she did mention the inclusion of dyes, but like these are very dye based because they really start to fall apart once you add a lot of water. They are just not good for wet and to wet. It takes a lot more paint to get any kind of color. These are also getting used up pretty fast. You can see some divots in there. I definitely feel like these are more of a student grade than a professional grade, which is funny because, again, Christy did that big student grade comparison video, so she knows what bad and mediocre watercolors look like. And for 44 bucks, I feel like we could have gotten something a little bit better. Now, what I'm running over in my mind is the Josie Lewis Mungio palette better than this or worse than this? And I'm not going to get too, too much into it because it really, I think, depends on the artists themselves and what they're looking for and what kind of qualities they're looking for. Now, I feel like Meng Yo handles pretty student grady for what I'm looking at, and it doesn't always do quite what I want it to do, but it's a known entity, and, like, everybody white labels Meng Yo. These, uh, I'm not sure if they're semi art, but they really feel like semi art. They really, the color choices are kind of semi arty. The inclusion of a random fluorescent is kind of semi arty. So while I'm not 100% sure these are semi art, they're definitely not what I would consider a professional grade watercolor. Now, to put my money where my mouth is, as I mentioned earlier, I pulled some, or as close as I could get, of the colors that she talks about in the book and they're not all from the brands that she recommends and I understand that there was some curation with selecting colors that um, are like really good versions from that brand so it's not perfect and I wasn't able to get you know exactly what she was talking about I kinda had to fill it in here and there so you know I did my best but I think this will give us an idea at least for how a prof oh, wow, I like how I'm just totally off shot. How a professional grade watercolor will handle compared to Christy Rice's. So we have some Holbein, we have some Daniel Smith, we have some PWC, we have some Core. I am a little surprised that I don't have any Winsor Newton here, but I typically like just other colors from Winsor Newton than what she recommended. What I am absolutely missing is the cadmium red and the cadmium yellow medium. I don't really use cadmiums a whole lot. I do have some cobalts. I don't have a lot of cadmiums. I don't really feel like I need that kind of, that color opacity in my palette too much. So we're not gonna be seeing any cadmiums today. I might be biased because these are watercolors that I selected, rebuy, and use, but I feel like the professional versions just shine brighter. There's more opacity when there needs to be opacity. There's interesting granulation in some of the colors. Granulation and nuance to Payne's gray. Compared to their professional versions, Christi Christie's feels very flat. Also, I'm aware that she's more lenient on paints than I am. She's more of a use good paper person, and I'm more of a use good paints person. But I'm holding her to the claims made on the website. These don't really compare very favorably against their professional counterparts. And I might be biased because, I mean, these are watercolors that I selected, rebuy, and use. So I am pretty attached to these colors. I like them specifically. But I feel like the professional versions of some of these very similar colors just shine brighter. There's more opacity where there actually needs to be opacity. Some of these opaque colors feel very flat and very thin. There's interesting granulation in Moon Go Glow, cas uh, Undersea Green, and Cascade Green, and that adds nuance and entrance. And there's still granulation and nuance to Payne's Gray, and it isn't the Payne's Gray that she recommends. It's a That's a Payne's Blue Gray. I just don't happen to have it, so I grabbed a Payne's Gray that I generally like and use. So compared to prof the professional cousins here, Christie's watercolors in her palette fall very flat. And these colors were selected based on what she recommends, not the brands. I didn't have all the 
all of them in the right brand, and I admit that. But like the color choices, the color types are actually really interesting and really pretty. I can see why she likes these colors. I can see why she goes for these colors when I swatch their professional counterparts. Whereas up here, it just feels very flat, a little fake, and kind of like candy. Next up is the lift test. Now, I'm going to do lift tests for both of these so we can actually get some comparison going on and see how Christie's watercolors compare to the professional counterparts. I am so glad I swatched the professional watercolors before we did the lift test because they exemplify what I'm looking for very well. So with Christie's watercolors, they are very, very staining. There isn't a lot of lifting. And you might think that's a good thing, but you see different pigments have different staining and granulation properties. And if something's more granulating, it's more likely to lift up. And I have found that often with more opaque colors, they're also more likely to lift up. But Christie's all behave about the same. Whereas their professional counterparts, we have some very lifting colors. We have some very staining colors. And the opaque colors in general, I was a little surprised that Jean Yellow didn't lift more. But the very opaque colors do seem to be pretty um, lifting, easier to lift up. And these were literally just applied. These have had several hours to dry. These have literally just dried, and yet they're exhibiting a range of characteristics. Now, really, we would let it dry completely overnight and then do the lift test. Uh, that would be the best faith way to do it, but ain't nobody got time for that. This is why I don't do light fastness testing. And if any of y'all have done light fastness testing on Christie's palette, I would love to hear what you found because I don't think these are very light fast at all particularly compared to their professional counterparts and um, I mean I'm gonna remind you guys again the listing and the site claims that these are highly pigmented professional watercolors that any artist from a beginner to a professional will love I've decided to do the field test on the postcard she included I was actually gonna pick an exercise from her book and try using her paints for that um, but I'm just going to take advantage of the postcard she included and use that instead. I think that'll work just as well. But I realize some of you guys are not really familiar with my work. You're here because you're curious about Christie's palette. So I wanted to take a moment just to show you guys the kind of art that I like to make. So I like bright colors. I like plant painting plants and people and insects. And I have a very narrative art style. I make watercolor comics. So... I use a lot of layers in my work. I like to build things up over time. I use a variety of techniques from wet and to wet to splatters to negative painting to lifting things back out. Loads of layering, lots of spray techniques to try and get the paints moving and get them more active. Um, I use masking fluid pretty frequently like on the, the rain droplets on this one here. This was done right after Hurricane Ida. I live in the area that was hit Maybe not the hardest. Laplace probably got hit the hardest, but we were right up there with Laplace. Um, and this was painted to signify the hope I felt for renewal and rebirth. And it was inspired by my mom's apple tree. This is the kind of work that I like to make. And if you like my work and you'd like to own some of it, you can find art prints and hopefully originals soon at natasoup.com slash shop. I hope you guys will check it out. But I wanted to show you like a reminder, even for my friends who are familiar with what I do, just to kind of ground us so that we know where I'm coming from and we know what I'm looking for and we know what I want from watercolors so that you guys understand my bias and you understand my background and you can decide whether this review is helpful for you or not at all helpful for you. So this is the included Christy Rice postcard. It is gray lines printed on a cellulose paper, I believe. Um, and since it was a pack-in, I'm not really going to comment or criticize it too much because it was free. It's on both sides. I'm just going to paint one side. I don't think this paper is... I'm not confident that this paper would really accept being painted on two sides. Um, it is borderless printing, so it doesn't really give me anywhere to put the tape. So I'm going to do my best. 
and we'll just we'll just see what we end up with I am hoping it won't buckle and curl too much again I'm not really looking to criticize the postcard I'm looking to review and judge the paints and man ever since I saw that she's doing a beginner like an introduction set that seems like it's dots rather than whatever these are um, I know they're extruded paints I meant whatever brand they these are I'm wondering if that is really the better Christy Rice experience if you absolutely need a Christy Rice experience. The paints and the palette present a lot of problems. First off, the color gamut in this set is challenging to use for this kind of illustration, but probably lends itself quite well to Christie's loose florals. I'm not even really aiming for all that natural of a paint job, but the two olivish greens are so similar I almost can't tell them apart and it's a bit of a challenge to mix yellows and oranges from the fluoro yellow included. I have no real use for the titanium buff, brilliant pink, or jean yellow for this illustration, but perhaps if she selected like an apple blossom design I'd feel very differently. The colors bleed way too much when you do wet into wet, so you can't really get a diffuse wet into wet. See the morning glories and the figs because it all just rushes to fill the space left by the water. If this postcard was chosen to showcase the palette, I would recommend rethinking that and possibly going for a larger design because it's quite challenging to paint such small busy items with these particular paints. You can see that I like to use wet into wet to develop shading and create interest. These watercolors desaturate quite a bit as they dry, losing a lot of that impact. With the color selection and the limits of dye based paints, you really can't get much more saturated than what I've got here. Also, this postcard curls up quite a bit, so I'm not sure how you're supposed to paint both sides. Maybe do one side, put it in a book for a couple of months, and then do the other side. It was fun to color without thinking too hard and just sort of relax, but these paints are really underwhelming. I have a lot of complaints about this. I will focus on the most salient point. These paints don't do what I want them to do. You guys know I do a lot of wet and wet. I do a lot of shade blending like you guys saw me attempting to do on this. I think the paper could have handled it. These paints cannot. They rush to fill the very edges of the water rather than giving kind of a gradual shade to it. So for a technique I use all the time, I don't think these paints are capable of doing that. I also don't think they were the best fit for this postcard just because the color palette that I see kind of being hinted at here, it was hard to get some of those colors. Like there wasn't a true yellow. We have the fluoro yellow, we have Jean Brilliant, and we have red and I could kind of mix um, a golden rodish orange to kind of get that. Also these two greens in practice are way too similar. You might as well just have one of them. You don't really need both, especially with the fluoro yellow. So that also starts to feel kind of redundant. I'm disappointed in these, I'll say that. And there have been a few YouTubers who have released reviews of these recently who really like them. I didn't want to bias my opinion or spoil this review, so all I saw was the thumbnails. But it seemed like they really enjoyed them. That said, we have vastly different art styles, and they do more of the wa loose watercolor florals, so this might be a better match with that. 
So while I remove this from its taped prison, and it curled a lot. I don't know how you're supposed to secure this down. Maybe you're supposed to use Chinese watercolor weights once it's done to kind of reflatten it. I don't even know. I want to talk to you guys about influencer watercolor brushes because there are several art influencers. I'm only going to name three today, but there are several who have their own watercolor brushes out there. I'm not going to review any, at least I'm not, I'm not planning on it because all the ones I've seen like Paulina Bright, Christy Rice, The Pigeon Letters, they are overpriced compared to what I can easily buy here, even in Southeast Louisiana. If you've got a Blick, if you've got a Jerry's, you've got even more options. And all of them seem to be synthetic watercolor brushes. I like a mixed fiber or I like a natural fiber or I like a good, like, like y'all see me use silver black velvet. If somebody's doing a collab with silver black velvet and it's a set of brushes that are in shapes that I don't have and I think I would find useful, then yeah, I will buy them. I'm not like totally saying I'm never or if they like if they bought a bunch of art secret brushes white labeled a bunch of art secret brushes and like we're really going for unusual brushes or interesting effects brushes yeah I would consider it then but like all of these synthetic watercolor brushes like what Christy Rice offers like what Polina Bright is currently offering with her synthetic quills like with the pigeon letters they are very very overpriced for what you're getting so I'm not impressed synthetic is fine overpriced is not so you guys can see the design on the other side I think she just cut the center out and maybe enlarged it a bit I mean that's kind of a, a cute way to do these kind of watercolor postcards I am always as a fellow artist and small business I'm always looking for good ideas that I can repurpose I mean that's what we all do right great good artists borrow great artists steal when it comes to ideas <laughs> but the more the deeper I'm getting into the nascent easily influenced series the more I'm like maybe I'll never want to do a watercolor palette unless it is with core or da Vinci that would be the people I would be cool giving like sharing my name with but So this was the first in my Easily Influenced series where I read the book in its entirety before looking at the paints. And uh, so I'm going to handle the pros and cons a little bit differently from how I normally would where I would just focus on the paints. So in general, I really enjoyed Christie's Art for Joy's Sake book, and I think it contains a lot of great projects, information, and exercises. I do wish it included more step-by-step -step photos, but I understand how hard it is to constantly take those. Believe me, I heartfeltedly understand that, and if I ever do an art book, that's what I'm going to put all of the effort into is getting those step-by-step -step photos because I feel like that is such a good opportunity for me to do something that's a little out of the ordinary. I also feel like you can probably find demonstrations for some of her techniques online, like if you needed more information about them, if you dig. That said, her YouTube channel doesn't really make it obvious, but I'm sure it's there. I also think there's like brush exercises, ways of thinking about color, ways of just playing with color that even someone like me who has a vastly different art style, a very different art trajectory from Christy, could bring into my art practice and enjoy. And look, I have to be very honest with you guys. I am an anxious, anxious person. I love art the way we love oxygen. If I quit drawing, painting, telling stories, that would kill a huge part of me. So we have, I think, different needs from our art, different desires for our art, and different audiences for our art. So some of what she likes and some of what she does is just not going to work for me. And that doesn't make it bad or invalid. It's just very different. So let's talk about the palette. The tin, these waters, waters, these watercolors come in is very cute. It is very, 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 very cute. It is also very, very branded. It's very cute. It's a pretty standard mini 12 uh, slot watercolor palette. It didn't come with a brush. It didn't even come with a water brush. That's a pretty common pack-in, but it is super stinking cute. I think some of the claims they make on the website about how special, unique, big it is, they're a little bit of a stretch. I'll be real. Like, this is a very common palette style, so I was kind of unimpressed with all the hype. But the screening on it is super cute. And I am impressed by that. 
and the included postcard and envelope were a really nice touch. Not only does it give you something to start making art immediately, and I think that really ties in with her goal of making art for joy's sake and being fearless about making art, this kind of makes it easier. It takes some of that pressure away. And she also has a bunch of art kits on her site as well. And I think those really do lead into just enjoying making art and making art accessible and making art something that everyone can bring into their lives, regardless of whether they can draw or not, regardless of their skill level. And obviously, as a woman who has 10 years blogging experience, who shared her whole grad school, art grad school experience on the blog so others could learn from me and from my critiques and the things that I went through and has been on YouTube since 2015. I resonate with that. Like I really, and I teach, I teach kids and I teach teens and I sometimes teach adults. So I really vibe with that idea. I am very pro let's make art accessible because I firmly believe that the more people who just do art, who just make art, the more people who can appreciate art and will want art in their homes instead of just going to Walmart and picking up some print that kind of sort of matches what they've already got, they may be able to go to like a craft fair and find something that genuinely speaks to them because they know the time, effort, and energy it takes. So I resonate with all of that. Now, this said, the branding makes it very clear to me that this is kind of a fan product. Her name is, and her logo, are all over everything. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That doesn't make this, you know, less of what it is. It doesn't make it, um, now see, she's got, I don't know, she included this with her paints, but look, here's a cute little mini palette of, like, two watercolors and half pans. Like, I don't know, it's some confusing branding. But anyway, like, her name and her face are literally all over here. So I have to give her kudos for her branding because I am like the most forgettable person ever. My family forgets that I'm a comic artist. So like, I gotta be taking some pages out of Christie's book, right? But it feels like a fan product. And I think there are probably other ways that you can be a fan of Christie's other than buying this palette. Um, I think her art is gorgeous, and I think her art prints are very fairly priced, and they're beautiful. And she has all these other art kits on her site that include paintable line arts. Now, I haven't tested the paints in those yet, so I'm not sure about the quality. And I think those things, the book, her coloring books, her art prints, her originals, her ceramics, I think all of those are a better way to support what she does and to own some of what she does than these paints in particular. Just do buy the paints she recommends in that section. Those are good paints. You will be happy with those paints. They are going to be able to do for you what uh, what these paints here are not able to do for you. So let's talk about the cons. And most of the cons are about these paints. These paints are so overpriced for the quality of the paints inside. And yeah, she does include an hour long getting to know your paints video. And I am going to watch that before I do the final end of the video video in case my opinion changes or shifts at all. So that is maybe potentially an added value. But I still think 44 buckarinos is too much to pay for these because the Paul Rubens Professional 24 color set, which I have reviewed and can vouch for, is $39.99 on Amazon and it is a better value for the paint. It also comes in like pink and mint green palettes. Like if we're talking about pretty and aesthetic art supplies, those are also pretty and aesthetic art supplies. And let's be real, y'all, you can put stickers on these things. In her own book, she recommends putting them in palettes that you find pretty. It doesn't have to be this. It could be something else. She also sells her empty palettes. I, so if you like really, really like her art and you want to carry it with you because it inspires you and it makes you feel um, creative and it makes you want to make art, you can buy the empties and put higher quality paints in there than what's in here. So what's so bad about her paints? Well, they are very dye-based. And <laughs> look, I'm, I, there are people who like to paint with dye-based watercolors. That is not me. I can't tell you why they enjoy it, but there are people who enjoy it, and I'm not here to yuck their yum. These are dye-based in a solid form. 
Maybe you would find that easier to deal with than the liquid form. I don't know, my dye-based watercolor friends, what's easier? These, the liquid ones, or watercolor markers? My preference is the watercolor markers. I find those a little bit easier to deal with if I'm doing dye-based watercolors. I like watercolors with some pigment in mineral, uh, animal, nature, some sort of inorganic, organic, some kind of pigment in it. I like what pigments do for watercolors. I like the granulation. I like the the separation of color at times. I like the saturation. I like the, the brilliance of real pigments on a page, which we saw her color selection is not really the problem because these are the colors she recommends in her book, minus a couple, and, you know, with slightly different brands because I'm using what I have, and it's a pretty palette. There are some that are a little too similar, but in general, I get kind of where she's coming from with these colors. I I kind of get it. Um, so, But you can see these are all from professional grade watercolors. These are Christie's. I think these have more impact, more saturation, more just more interesting things going on than her paints. They're more expensive. I will grant you that. You could get the Core Mini palette for about $20 more than Christie's palette. I think you'll like that a little bit better than Christie's palette. You can get the Da Vinci Mixing palette for a little bit more than Christie's palette, but I think you'll be a lot happier with that. And these paints are dye-based. They lose their saturation, their impact, their oomph very quickly once we add water to them. Once you mix two colors, they lose a lot of their impact. And while, yeah, technically you can mix a lot of colors, I would not say you can mix any color you need from this palette, okay? There's some poor choices if you wanted to mix any color in a palette like this. We're just missing a lot of the basics that would make that feasible. But with some clever color mixing, you can get a lot of what you're looking for. That said, the sum is less than the parts that go into it. And that is, that's not a good sign, in my opinion. Also, the swatch card she included is like, what? Why did you, why did you do cardstock? But that's almost kind of a nitpick. I, I would have gone with uh, a little bit of cotton rag paper because her paints do look a lot better on the cotton rag paper than they do on this. This is really, really unimpressive. If I were just swatching on this, that'd be kind of shameful. Ooh, boy, y'all. I really, really wanted to like these watercolors, especially because I really, really liked Christie's book and I think it is a good watercolor resource and literally the only real complaint I have is I wish it had more step-by-step -step photos. I think it's a good book. I think she's got some interesting ideas. I think she's got some interesting exercises. After reading this book, I was super hyped to try her watercolors. So I feel kind of bad. I feel kind of guilty that I don't like them and I can't recommend them. And I, I, I think you should save your money and not buy these watercolors. You should buy one of the other sets I talked about. You should buy professional grade watercolors. Don't, I cannot recommend this set. And you know, y'all see what kind of art I make. Y'all know what kind of artist I am. Y'all know I'm a comic artist. So if you do loose watercolor florals or loose watercolors or abstract watercolors, you may feel very differently about this palette than I do, and that's okay. But I do think some of my concerns are valid concerns. These are dye-boosted watercolors. She says so right on the package. This isn't me imagining things. And she claims that it has a light pass rating of seven. Now, I do understand lake pigments, and I do understand that there are some colors that are in a traditional watercolors palette that you could not achieve without using dyes. I understand that, but those also tend to be pretty fugitive, and often those are in student grade sets. So, like, even though there, that is part of our traditional watercolor heritage, and believe me, as a anime-inspired watercolor artist, I am not a big has to be traditional watercolor person at all. But like, they, 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 dye-based watercolors 
were very rarely like considered to be what you want to go for if you want archival watercolors. So I think even for the people who are doing, let's say, wedding invitations, or they're doing christening invitations, or they're doing graduation invitations, or Christmas cards, or any art like that, where, especially for the big events, where somebody might want to keep that art for a really long time, especially wedding stuff, it is important to use art supplies that are going to stand up to that. And my concern with the dye-based watercolors is, in my experience, they fade very quickly. Now, if you're making watercolor comics and you're scanning the pages and you're selling the books, no one's going to see those fading pages. Those pages will live in a portfolio. They might not even fade. But it still concerns me because, as you guys saw, these really market themselves as being professional-grade, highly pigmented watercolors that are suitable for beginners and experienced artists. And while you might or might not like my art, you might or might not resonate with my vibe, I have a lot of experience with watercolor and I don't like these watercolors. And that's okay. You don't have to like everything, but I've also reviewed a lot of watercolors and I don't like these watercolors. I found them to be, and we just did the pros and cons, I know. I found them to be kind of very one note and flat feeling, especially compared to the literal colors she recommends in her book. It's like, it's like you've got the real deal and then you've got what almost feels like a knockoff. And I know it's not a knockoff, I bought it from her. I also felt like the colors did not, and she is a big one on, you should be able to mix any color you need. This set is not designed as a mixing set. It's got a lot of very opaque colors that just don't make for good, clean mixes that you would expect. Like the inclusion of a color that is basically titanium buff, but it has like no coverage to it. And as someone who likes to use titanium buff, especially to add highlights on darker skin tones, her titanium buff would not be useful for that. If you're looking for a good titanium buff or buff titanium, Daniel Smith's is okay, but I really like cores. I just started using cores and I really like cores. So um, this compare, in fact, the core one is the one I have swatched down here. Hers compared to the core one is just kind of like womp womp. And then she includes a fluorescent yellow and she does not really talk about fluorescent yellow in her book a whole lot. She does talk about Crayola watercolors, which sometimes include a fluorescent yellow, but she doesn't talk about a fluorescent yellow in general and doesn't really, I didn't really see much of that in her book. Whereas Payne's Gray is a color she mentions and I can see it in her work. So I don't understand why she didn't include a Payne's Gray other than having reviewed a lot of really cheap AliExpress watercolors that are dye-based, they tend to not like to include Payne's Gray either. So I kind of have a theory that her paints are white label paints in a custom tin that you could also white label. Her tin is beautiful, by the way, but you can also white label those tins and have them screened with your design on them. It's kind of pricey, but it's doable. And um, that's what you're paying all the money for. Um, she included a postcard with an envelope. I don't know if this is meant to be the free pack-in. As somebody who does art prints and coloring sheets, I know the margins on art prints and coloring sheets, and I, I don't feel like this pack-in makes up for the cost, the, the fact that her website costs more and the cost of shipping. And I only bring that up because she mentioned it on her community tab. Um, so usually, and of course I'm going to compare us. I'm also a small businesswoman who sells art. When people buy my books or they buy original art or they buy an art print, if they're buying from me online, I always throw in goodies, like a lot of goodies. Like I'll dedicate the books and I have this custom coloring sheet thank you card and I'll write a little thank you note on the back and I throw in all these stickers or sometimes I'll throw in postcards. I am, or sometimes I'll throw in pins, depending on the person. If you're one of my patrons, you've probably gotten one of my pins if you bought from me because it's so meaningful to me when you support my work. It really makes my day. It really makes me happy. And I can't do what I'm doing if people don't enjoy and support my work. Like it's just not feasible for me to make the amount of things I make without some support. 
So I want to show my appreciation and I don't expect everyone to do as many free pack-ins as I do. I just felt like this was kind of underwhelming and I don't know, she, hmm, a sticker or you know what I mean? Um, a mini print would have been cute, but I understand that the free pack-in is mostly to make up for the fact that Amazon is being very flaky and that you have to go to her site and it's not as convenient as just throwing it in your Amazon cart and buying it when you're buying everything else. And it doesn't include free delivery and the delivery time takes a little bit longer and it costs more. I, I, I understand all that. I'm just, I'm just pointing it out because part of this series is also about me seeing what these art influencers, small businesses and fellow artists are doing and seeing what I can learn from them or seeing what I like about how I run my business and want to continue staying the course. So gaining experience and seeing how other people do things and thinking about how other people do things is a great way to learn and a great way to grow what you're doing. So another thing is I felt like once we started adding a lot of water, like in the wet into wet test that I do for all of the student grade showdown, it really starts to fall apart. And it might look bright and vibrant now, but I had to really go in and add that color which is not something you typically see from a professional grade, highly pigmented watercolor. It's something you see from a student grade watercolor. And to be realistic, as someone who has reviewed Buku student grade watercolor sets, the price point for student grade watercolors is much lower than what Christy is selling her set for. And you usually get at least twice as many paints. So. If these are student grade or student quality watercolors, I do feel like they're very expensive for what they are. Oh, I did also watch the hour long video. Half of it you could find on literally any other watercolor YouTube channel for free, like just open to the public. It's You can find it on my channel in great detail in my watercolor crash course. And I'm not here to yuck or yum. I'm just saying it wasn't new territory, but the back end of her video where she showed how she does her leaves and how she thinks about painting flowers was so, yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. It was good. I appreciated that. I wanted more of that. I wanted this book to be more of that. There was actually very little about loose florals in this book. And that's why I bought this book is I thought, cause I mean, the cover has loose florals on it. Well, it's got mixed media and she does do this project, but I wanted more of that. I'm sure her channel, has that but every time I go to her channel I don't see that so uh, <laughs> I appreciated the inclusion of that in her video especially because that is a skill that I would like to improve with and that's why I've been studying Chinese watercolor is a lot of it is so brush stroke reliant and the kind of art I do is let's say more mannered and I don't mean that as in a better way it's just more tightly controlled and I like the loose freedom that, and the freshness that she's able to bring into her art. So I was really hoping for more of that. And to be fair, she did in, in her, uh, if you paid for this palette, you get this video, video. She is using this palette for that. I don't know how she got some of the colors she was able to get from it because I could not, but she was able to do that. In fact, as you guys saw, I did a field test where I painted the included postcard and I was having just so much trouble with wet into wet. I just could not get it to do what I do on a regular basis. And I know Christy has mentioned in her book that she's not a paint snob, but she's particular about her paper. Um, I'm the opposite. I, well, I'm not really them. I'll use student grade. I won't use Crayola. Uh, I'm more of a paint snob than a paper snob. I will use cellulose. I will use uh, mixed media papers. I feel like good paints, I can get what I want, not regardless of the paper. In fact, I have a video where I show you the dangers of doing watercolor in your sketchbook. Your choice, but you might not like what you make. Um, so I'm more paper flexible than she is. Uh, these, <laughs> these paints are a waste of cotton rag, in my opinion, and I used Cotton, I don't know what this postcard is, but I used cotton rag for all of my tests with these paints. So I feel like that was a pretty fair assessment. So 
I hope you guys found this dual review of both Art for Joy's Sake Free Spirited Watercolor. I like how I point to it and I don't hold it up. Uh, this, this book here, and I got it in the spiral binding, and I find I love that for watercolor books. Like, seriously, I love that. If I should ever have the pleasure of doing a watercolor book, that is what I would want. I enjoyed her book. I would recommend her book. Uh, if she, if you are ever interested, Christy, in doing another how-to watercolor book, please do. Really enjoyed your book. And please do one on more on the florals. There was a lot about the florals, but more on the florals with more photos this time, please. My, my opinion on the Art for Joy's Sake palette is please skip it. Please just buy, buy her book and then buy the watercolors she recommends in her book. And it will be a little more expensive, but it's going to last you way longer than her palette will. And you will like it so much more. And since we are all here about empowering people to make art and empowering people to love art and to unleash their artistically creative side and to play with color and to play with paints, I feel like encouraging you guys to buy the slightly better paints if you can afford them. They will last you longer. They are going to have more interesting effects. And the art you make with them, if you choose to put it up, and I hope you choose to put it up because your house should be full of the things you make if you can help it, or the things people you like have made. Uh, my house is full of the things people I like and other artists have made, and it makes me very happy. I want the things you buy and the things you make to stand the test of time. I want you to grow tired of it before it fades on your wall. And I don't know that her palette is capable of doing this. And I also know that as a watercolor comic artist who paints, like some of my pages are like four or five panels. I have painted, counting comic pages, thousands of illustrations. The paints in this set would drive me batty before I got through just one chapter. So I really, whereas if you go with her color recommendations, while those are not ideal for comics, they're good paints and they're good colors. And I think you would be happy with them. Just not in this format. I promise the series is not about ragging on more popular creators. In fact, I have one coming up. It's going to be a double header that I'm really excited about because I like the brand who's making their paints. Um, I am reviewing the Denise Soden, might be the earth friendly palette. It's the big 24 color palette that I was like, yes. And uh, I also have the small sample palette of Charlie O's colors and I really like Da Vinci's paints. So I'm thinking the next easily influenced should be a knock out of the park. And I'm also going to give you a little bit of a, a sneak peek, a spoiler. I actually ordered one of Jazz's bags um, and that's on Kickstarter, so it's going to take a while to come in. I'm not like, I'm waiting for it, I'm waiting for it. But I'm giving y'all a heads up that I actually captured the footage of me, not the whole purchasing process, but, you know, some of that process, as well as um, a little bit of one of the backer updates. Not to, not to ruin anything, but just to show the process. And uh, I will be doing an easily influenced whenever that bag comes in. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. And I appreciate, sincerely appreciate those of you who have recommended other watercolor sets uh, by other watercolor artists, influencers, influential watercolorists. Uh, the Mind of Watercolor M. Graham set was suggested by Allie. So thank you for that suggestion. I also like M. Graham's, so that is certainly something that I will be considering and saving my Patreon funds to be able to purchase. And if you guys, I'm also thinking about doing some of the Jake Parker Inktober things, but I'm still kind of mulling it in my mind. And I am aware of the Mossery Art Kits, but those are, whoo, 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 those are, those are so expensive. I'm not going to do all of them. There's no way I could do all of them. I'm mostly interested in the Iraville and then the From Plate to Paper ones are the two I'm most interested in. And then if you are enjoying this series, I did do the Hey Kelia box a while back and I really enjoyed the curation that was involved in that box. There's been, there's been some positive reviews and I feel like when I eventually have the money to buy those other sets to talk to you guys about them, 
there should be some positive reviews there as well. I should at least have good things to say about the art supplies. It's such a bummer that I don't like the art supplies. It's wasted money on my part. I bought everything in good faith, you know? And that's why I talked about the brushes and I'm not going to do brushes unless it's like a silver black velvet collab or an art secret collab or it's it's a brand that I know and I like and then I'll be willing to do invest the money to see if I like the curation in that set because my intention is not to just rag on these other creators. My intention is to find art supplies that I like, that you'll like, and that I can recommend because it makes me happy to be able to recommend good art supplies for people, but it also makes me feel happy when I can help people save money by not buying art supplies that they don't particularly care for. So thank you guys so much for watching and hanging out with me today. I feel like I'm serving Bridgerton vibes, and I was really going for like, cottage core vibes with this but eh, you know if you enjoy what i do and you want to help me continue to be able to do it you can join me on patreon at patreon.com slash soup you'll get early access to reviews like this one in better times in better months where i have free time i also share backer exclusive printable coloring sheets and line arts if you ever want to color or paint along with me i also share class materials like presentations um templates, principles that I generate for the classes that I teach when I'm teaching a new class or when I greatly revise a class. And all of that should be accessible. Even if you join today, you just might have to dig for it. I really wish Patreon would add some kind of an organizational system so I could make all of that easily visible so you can see everything you have access to and you can realize that there's a huge backlog of printables and templates and classes that I don't share with the public that are up on my Patreon. But I use the funds from my Patreon to purchase things like this or things like the book. Um, so if you like what I do and you want to help me continue to be able to do it, patreon.com slash soup. And it would also really mean the world to me. So you know what I'm talking about and where I'm coming from. If you would check me out and check out my art on these social media sites here. It would also really mean a lot to me if you would go take a look at my comic, Seven Inch Carrot. You can read it again as a webcomic at seveninchcarrot.com. So you can see where my heart is and you can also see where I'm coming from as an art supplier reviewer and as an artist. And if you like my art and you would like to own some of my art, I have adorable art prints to sale there, for sale. They are printed through cat print on their felt paper and I, I'm so happy with them. These are not wrapped because I didn't want the sun to cast glare on them, but they are wrapped in UV resistant glassine bags and have an acid free matte board backer in there just to make sure that they stay nice and beautiful looking until you're able to frame them. If you even choose to frame them, you may just decide to pop them up on the wall as is, but you can find those at natasoup.com slash shop. I also have my books up there. And if you would like to own some of my original art, please nag me to start listing it in my shop. Or, or you can email me and say, hey, I saw such and such a piece in such and such a video. You can literally link me the tutorial. I will check and see if I still have it because I do also sell at craft fairs and shows um, and get back to you with a price and we can work from there. But uh, you can find all of that at natasoup.com slash shop. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I hope this was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. I hope if you are new here, you will leave a thumbs up if you like this video. Leave a comment down in the description. I asked y'all lots of questions, so there's lots to work with. And consider subscribing and clicking the bell notification so you can hear more from me and so that you will be notified when I do my next easily influenced art influencer slash influential artist review. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. I hope to see you guys again really soon. Bye guys!